Well, welcome again to our to the Philippians. As we said in our first lesson, Paul dictated this as he was chained to a Roman soldier in a prison in Rome. Not, if I could say this, the best place where one could write or dictate an epistle that was going to be used eternally throughout the world for countless generations and on into the millennial reign of Christ. But nonetheless, Paul, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> wrote this in most adverse circumstances. And I don't think any one of us would like to be in prison, but certainly not in the kind of prison that Paul was in, where he couldn't move without where he couldn't move without the Roman soldier moving with him. Well, this epistle contains some of the most profound truths that Christianity reveals. And in the second chapter, we have an extraordinary understanding of what is might call the mind of Christ. And uh, Paul goes on to say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it speaks of seven steps downward that our Saviour had to take to indeed be the one who brought unto us eternal salvation. What are those steps? Well, first of all, we are told that he was equal with God. He was equal with God. It's something that we have to understand that the Godhead is composed of three people. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But, there is, if I could say this, a preeminence in the Godhead, in that the Father is the Head, then the Son, then the Holy Spirit. But, in reality, of course, Jesus is divine. And here he was, as the Son of God, seated at the right hand of the Majesty on high, and... We are told in Isaiah there came a moment in heaven when God, as it were, seeing the condition of the world, seeing the sinfulness of the world, he cried out, Whom shall we send and whom will go for us? We are told by those that have had visions of this scene that there was a silence in heaven. Although everybody was willing all the angels, archangels were willing. Everyone realized they weren't able. And then from the right hand of the majesty on high, the Son of God stepped forth from his throne and came before the Father and bowed and said, Here am I, send me. We're told in Isaiah that God the Father said, go. And then there is that vision, if I could say this, of Christ descending from the throne, the highest point in heaven, the throne of God, coming down, down and down, until we have that miracle, if I could say this, of creation, whereby the Son of God came into the very womb of Mary. Well, we move on, and here he became, we are told, that he made himself of no reputation. You know, when we consider, here he was, the king of kings, and you would consider that someone who was royalty had to be born in a palace. In fact, that was a case with King George VI, the father of uh, our present Queen Elizabeth, when she was pregnant with Prince Charles, he insisted 
that, that little chap be born as he was going to be king one day, be born in a royal palace. But the king of kings, no. He was born in a manger amongst all those animals. And you can imagine the effluvium that there must have been in that manger. He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Although king, he became a servant. And he would say with great authority to those around him when he began his ministry some 30 years later, he said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And here was the King of Kings taking the lowly form of a servant. And he made himself in the likeness of men. You know it says in Hebrews that man was made a little lower than the angels. And the angels, certainly with all reverence towards them, are made essentially far lower than God. And here he was, being made like unto man, who is made lower than the angels. And uh, it continues, and he was made in the likeness of men, the likeness of men. You know, with all our limitations. You know, you consider who he was, God, who had no limitations before, having all knowledge, all power, and yet he was willing to be made like unto us with all our limitations. And then being found in the fashion of the man, he, uh, uh, he humbled himself. He humbled himself to be a servant of God and he became obedient unto death. It's very interesting. In that manger, there came the three wise men. They brought unto him three gifts which were very significant. Gold, which speaks of his deity. Gold speaks of deity. Frankincense, which speaks of suffering. And myrrh, which speaks of meekness, or was an embalming fluid that was used to embalm the dead, could also speak of death. So here, in that manger scene, these three Wise men presented gold, saying, here is God. Frankincense, meaning suffering, born to suffer, and myrrh, to die. God born to suffer and to die. Well, he became obedient unto death, but not just death, but the death of the cross. It was the most ignominious form of capital punishment in the Roman Empire. So debasing was it that no Roman citizen could be put to death by crucifixion. Only slaves and members of nations that they had conquered. And yet it was to this death that Christ became obedient well he was brought low but you know we then read on that because he was obedient and indeed became obedient unto the cross mocked spit upon treated with such contempt and abuse God then raised him up to sit with him again at his right hand and exhorted him and given him a name which is above every name. Throughout the world, the name of Jesus is known, is revered by virtually every religion. The name of Jesus. God had given him a name. The name of Jesus, every Knees shall bow, 
whether in heaven, all angels bow before the name of Jesus. We, when we're in heaven, will bow at his name. Things on earth, all earth, at his second coming, will bow the knee when he comes again. And also, things under the earth. What are under the earth? Well, under the earth is hell. And all Satan's minions, Satan himself, will have to bow at the name of Jesus. Why did God give him such a wonderful name? Well, it was because he obeyed perfectly the will of God and gave his life for us, that through his blood we might be washed from our sins as we believe in his name. And so that every name, every name that is named on this world shall be as nothing compared to the name of Jesus. And therefore every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now then, Paul develops this thought, well, if Jesus was so obedient, what about us? In other words, he has given us an example of the life that we should live, a life of obedience to God's will that he has already ordained for us before the foundation of the world. And so, he goes on to say this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, it's one thing to receive Christ as our Savior, but then we have to realize that afterwards, there is a life to be led for the glory of God. And God, we are told by the Apostle Paul, works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, God is working in us to transform us, to be more and more like Christ, and indeed to be what he has ordained us to be before the foundation of the world. And so he says, well, do things without murmuring and disputing. You know, we're not called to be argumentative, but we're called to have our eyes anointed, our eyes opened, so that we might see indeed that all things that are taking place around us and are affecting us are permitted by God for our instruction and our purification. Because indeed, the ultimate goal of God is this for our lives, that we might be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of this crooked and perverse world among whom we shine, we must shine as lights. Christ is the light of the world and we are called to be lights wherever we go, in the community where we live, in the workplace in the school, or whatever. And we are to hold forth that word of life. You see, in other words, we are to manifest the graces of God in this life so that we can be true witnesses of Christ, so that others can see and learn about Christ through looking at our own lives. Well, the goal of a pastor is revealed in verse 17, where Paul says that if I be offered upon your sacrifice and service of your faith, I will rejoice. And he goes on to say that he does rejoice. He gives God thanks for each and every one of them. And that is the purpose of a pastor, to indeed care for the people, to preach in such a way that they are transformed by the word of God that when this life is over, the pastor might present his congregation before the Lord, and the Lord can examine his congregation and say to the pastor, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, what kind of people does God want us to present before him? 
You know, it speaks of three classes of Christians. The little babies that know, or little children that know that their sins are forgiven. The young men who are strong in the word, who have resisted and overcome temptation. Then the fathers or mothers in Israel who have indeed come to know the Father, God the Father. Well, obviously, you know, a pastor doesn't want to present just little children to the Lord, but he wants to present mature saints, if I could say that. That is why the pastor labors hard in order to indeed encourage people not to stay where they are, as little babes in Christ, but to go on unto maturity. And so, he speaks of, uh, Paul speaks of one of his spiritual sons, Timothy. And look what he says about Timothy. And this illustrates that of which I've been speaking about the maturity in Christ. He says this, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. No man like-minded of all the hundreds, thousands of people that Paul came in contact with throughout his ministry. He said of Timothy, I have no man like-minded. And then he continues and qualifies that very clearly. He said, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And so, Paul is saying, look, I have this spiritual son that I'm going to send unto you. And you are going to see Christ in him. And he is going to make known to you all those things that I have taught. And uh, then he said he'll be a kind of forerunner that after you've seen him, you'll come and see me, Paul says. And that was his great hope. And then he speaks of another person, Epaphroditus. Now, we often think, and erroneously so, that the only way that we can minister is to preach or teach. And then, of course, we might say, well, You know, I'm not called to preach. I can't teach. And what can I do as a minister? But here we are introduced to a man called Epaphroditus, a beautiful man. And uh, he calls him his brother and companion in labor and a fellow soldier, your messenger, for he has ministered to my wants. Now, Epaphroditus was, if I could say this, one who was not necessarily a preacher or teacher, but one who was essential to the gospel, essential, if I could say this, to the message of Paul getting to the people, because he cared for the Apostle Paul. And moreover, He had a wonderful ministry in prayer. Now we're going to see some of the qualities of this wonderful man of God, Epaphroditus. And I want to put him before you so that you will be encouraged. That you will see that perhaps you might say, well I'm just a housewife, I I don't have the opportunity to preach, I don't have the opportunity to teach, I can't. I'm not a good student of the word of God, I don't have the ability And therefore, I can virtually do nothing. Oh, yes, you can. You can become like Epaphroditus. Well, Epaphroditus cared for the minister, if I could say that, Paul. But more than that, he had a distinct ministry. And we're going to have a look at this. Because Epaphroditus knew the Philippian people, and he longed after them, full of heaviness, because he had heard that he had been sick, and he was indeed a sick unto death, but God had mercy upon him. Me, you know, the Apostle Paul said, because 
Epaphroditus was so important to him. He labored in prayer. His heart was heavy for the Philippians. And I think you could understand that if you're a mother, if you're a father, and you've got a natural son who is not doing well, or a natural daughter that's not doing well. You might have all the other advantages in life, but you walk around with a heavy heart. You're broken in spirit because your son, your daughter, are walking in a way that is very displeasing and perhaps they've cast off the traces, as we say, and they're walking with companions that are only going to lead them to ruin and all the work that you have done to have raised them, they're almost casting behind their back and your heart is full of sorrow. And it's brought you down, perhaps, to physical sickness. Well, Epaphroditus was in that very position. He, however, was concerned about the whole congregation of the Philippian church. He labored in prayer. You know, prayer is not easy. You might say, well, prayer is like saying grace before a meal. But everybody could say grace before a meal. It doesn't take much. But there's another form of prayer whereby you take upon you the burdens of another. Whereby you enter in to the sufferings of another. Whereby you enter in to the lives of those who are not walking uprightly. And you feel the sorrow of Christ for them. You know, Christ himself did not die upon the cross through his physical wounds, but we're told in the Psalms that he died of a broken heart. Well, Epaphroditus indeed experienced great heaviness of spirit because of the condition of the Philippian church. They were, as it were, babies. They were still walking, as it were, in the world, being part of the world, walking as the world does, in all kinds of crookedness and sin. And Epaphroditus was indeed not only ministering to the needs of the Apostle Paul, but he was bearing the burden of this Philippian church. So much so that he himself had become sick in body. Well, there is an aspect of suffering that Paul explains in his epistles, whereby he suffers for the needs of others, to fill up the sufferings of Christ for his body's sake. And through those sufferings, there becomes a supply of the spirit of grace to those people who are walking adversely. And in fact, the Apostle Paul speaks in that way in Corinthian epistle. He said, death worketh in me that life might work in you. And that was true of Epaphroditus. He was feeling, as it were, the death of Christ in him. He was dying to self. He was dying to luxuries. He was dying to his own will, if I could say this, in prayer, so that God, by his grace, would indeed be able to pour out his Spirit upon the Philippian church and apprehend them for that which they had been apprehended of him. You know, it takes suffering to bring life. And certainly, Epaphroditus knew this suffering. And uh, we are told in verse 30, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, and in this case the supply your lack of service toward me. <laughs> 
he was becoming a servant also for Christ in that he ministered to the apostle Paul likewise. And I'm saying to you as we close this section I want you to meditate upon Epaphroditus. Perhaps you're not called to preach, perhaps not to teach. Perhaps you don't have finance that you can give to others, but you can give yourself in prayer for those in need. And as you enter into this life and ministry of prayer, you will know something of the tremendous sorrows of Christ for his body, the sufferings. You will know indeed you know, the heartaches that those in sin are experiencing. And through your travail in prayer, through experiencing perhaps something of the death of Christ in your own life, you will be releasing the Spirit of God to those people and whereby God can deliver them and bring them out of their bondage of sin. So, I want to encourage you. You know, this is one of these wonderful things, you see, and uh, that we can minister in prayer, and prayer can go around the world. You don't have to be in a country to pray for somebody, but through your prayers, they can be sustained. Pray for your pastor, pray for the missionaries. Oh, what a joyous time you'll have entering into their battles through prayer. And the wonderful thing